All righty. <clears throat> um, what we're going to start with is the all the information that has to go into command. And this is the list of everything that has to go in. <clears throat> you have an O&E from the title company. You need a seller's net sheet from public records, which is realist. You need a copy of that that's three pages. You need the copy of the listing agreement, definitions of working relationship, seller advisory. And I didn't put this in, but for a little while longer, we're going to use the seller advisory COVID-19. And that way, it's at the end of the month, I'm going to make that um, not mandatory um, or required, I should say. It's going to be um, suggested, OK? You have to have a property seller's disclosure, which the seller fills out. You need a square foot disclosure, which you can get the information off of your uh, realist information. If there's an HOA, you need to fill out common interest community checklist. Any and all uh, um, amend extends. Short sales and seller authorization, really don't need that on a normal transaction. Uh, but as the year goes on, we probably are gonna see and need to use those. And when we do, I'll get to those, when, how you use those. Uh, Lead-based paint disclosure, sales, and uh, lead-based paint obligation seller. This is if the house is built before January 1st, ah, 1978, I have 1078. So um, MLS printout sheet active. You need the source of water filled out, even though it's in your seller's property disclosure. You also need a closing instructions. If you would get all of these documents up front, then when your property goes under contract, you have less, is less, less issues. <clears throat> under contract, once it goes under contract, you need a, an MLS printout sheet under contract. You need a copy of upload the, uh, the contract that came in and was accepted by the seller. If there was a counter, you need to put that in there. A copy of the earnest money check and receipt, inspection objection, and inspection resolution, lead-based paint disclosure if needed, seller's property disclosure, square foot disclosure, source of water, closing instructions, all amend extends if there's needed a post-closing occupancy and a lender letter. Now, once you've done all of those, <clears throat> please note, do not Upload your doc. You can upload your documents, but do not submit them until you've completed the inspection resolution deadline. Then you can upload them, uh, and then you go to commission request and fill out those uh, documents in uh, all the information in commission request. That is how you get paid at closing, and that way you have all of your information in there. Um, Amy is uh, on vacation this week and won't be back until Monday. So uh, at this point, um, you just walk through much as much as you can. So now um, the under contract documents, ask the title company to send it to you in email form. You also need to upload the copy of the checks or the distribution sheet and a copy of the MLS sold sheet. And then in, 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 for your information, if you put any of the receipts and anything like the inspector report, you can put it at the bottom and just so that you have those if you have to go back and refer to them. <coughs> now, this is a copy of a listing agreement. And you start with your date that uh, you're filling it out. You always check multi-list multi-person firm, you go down and you get the seller's legal name from the realist document. When you put together this on CTME or even DocuSign, it'll automatically put the brokerage name and your name in there. On 3.4, that is the legal description of the property and the property address. Now on the 3.7, that is your listing of the time you begin and the time you end. I would strongly suggest that you put uh, six months in here because at the market we're dealing with now, the same property could go under contract 
a couple of three times, depending on inspection, appraisal, and those kinds of things. So you don't want to have to renew this contract. Then on 3.9.2, this is you will or will not have it fall on a holiday or after a holiday. I always check will, but it's up to what you want to do. Okay. Four is telling you your brokerage relationship. You are sellers agent only on 4.3.1.2. You are always a seller's agent um, unless you have a person who wants to buy the property and then you could switch to a uh, transaction broker. But that we have to discuss when that occurs to, with you. Five is all of your broken re broker relationships. This will tell you that you've got all of these relationships. You don't have to memorize them. You just have to become familiar with them. And when you check the box at the top up here, where it says seller agent, then you come down to number six. And six is three additional duties. They are promoting the interest of the seller, seeking a price and terms that are best set forth to the seller counseling the seller on the uh, benefits of these uh, offers that you get in. And take this one seriously, guys, because this is where you would end up having, if you're going to get fired, this will be the one you're going to get fired on, okay? Seven is your compensation. You can put um, any number in here. If you go below, go below the number 7.1.1 is what the total is not what you give other agents, it's a total. So you can do seven, you can do six, but if you go past below 5.6, you need to have a conversation with me because you are losing money on this listing. So out of the seven, we're giving 2.8 to the listing agent or uh, the buyer agent and 2.8 to the uh, transaction broker. That's what you're going to advertise in the MLS and that's what they're going to receive. I always put in a uh, leasing for um, if the people are going to lease, I charge 10% and it's at the time of listing. I'll be honest, I've never had to use it, um, but it always just puts it in there and make all parties honest here. Then on 7.1.3, I put in uh, other compensation. We don't have any at this time, so put down none at this time. Then on 7.2.3, is a holdover period, put 120 days in there. And again, you will be paid if somebody, you, this is to prevent any buyers coming behind your back and um, uh, taking the commission out of, uh, trying to bypass the commission. You can put 90, you can put 60, I don't really care, whatever is workable for you. Then on not eight and nine, you have compensation, you have listings. Nine is real important because uh, it tells us how we're putting it into the MLS. So yes, I will put it into the MLS. And yes, I will put it more than one place. On 9.1.2, seller's authorization. At this point, it, it, we don't have anything else uh, in the marketing. And I can just put that. But you might put some special marketing advertising on Facebook or, or something special that would happen to this listing. Now on the uh, 9.1.4, yes, you will display the address and yes, you'll have the property in, in, in the internet. Both of those will be checked as well. 9.2, how you access it, I encourage you to get an electronic lockbox from Smendra and make sure you set up your account because this is all kinds of things that come together with this lockbox and it keeps track of everything and it's a security thing for a seller. And then other instructions under the property access is you must call the seller for showings. So in other words, <coughs> Mary, I'm picking on you a little bit. Mary has a client uh, that works from home. So she needs to know after five, somebody's coming between five and eight and they need to be sure that they understand that. And they are aware of that. So always make sure the seller gets a call so that they know you don't have to get the call, but a seller would get a call. Then on 9.2.2, it's the box. You only want licensed people in the house. So active real estate, uh, real estate brokers and licensed appraisers. Okay. 
Appraisers have to go through 1,500 hours and 200 hours of schooling. We only have 168 for our license. So those two, you don't want to let anybody in that's not licensed, or you want to make sure that the selling agent is going to be there through any inspections. On 9.3.1, all, and then you want don't want to tie yourself down to too much because if you've got a condo, you don't do all the things that you might do for a house that's 300,000 square feet. So your best bet is to put down all professional marketing services offered by the brokerage firm as broker deems necessary. This way keeps you out of trouble, keeps from you having a situation where the, um, uh, you, if you list 100 things and you have a small condo, those people want 100 things. So you just want to be sure you customize it to however your property, how big your property is and what you're actually able to do. Now, 10.3 is very, very important because this is saying, no, I'm not currently in a party with another agent who has for a listing. And no, nobody submitted uh, prospects after if it was a, uh, a listing that um, had um, expired. No, the former agent didn't give the seller uh, any names of any persons he showed the property to. Doesn't mean it's another agent, just means that if he showed it or she showed it. Number 11 is our pricing and terms. So we've agreed upon 350 and it's going to be cash conventional FHA VA. Now, if you're listing a condo like Mary is, you have to check with the condo people to find out if you can accept a FHA or VA. Is that complex approved? Okay. Not and then at eleven point three, which is discount points, none at this time. And you will discover nothing at this time because of our market, but in the future it could be something. Eleven four is saying. Um, if you have an FHA and VA loan, the most a seller is going to pay is 350. So the fees can go from 50 to 350, and you have to specify who's going to pay it. Buyers cannot pay those. Sellers shall decide at the time of offer if any seller concession shall be given. That's in case somebody put something in there that the, buy, that the buyers want. 11.5 is talking about your earnest money. On 350,000, you can do three to 5,000. That works real well. Um, maybe over four, you can do a strong five. Um, when you get to say 500 and 600 and 700, I'd make it about 7,000 or 8,000. There's a point when you get so high that the uh, you go to a different court if there's a dispute, $7,500. It, and below are small claims, 7,500 and above are going to be um, a higher federal court. So the proceeds can be given to a seller in the form of a cashier's check or it can be wired. If the seller elects for it to be wired, the seller has to call directly the title company and get the wiring instructions from them. You do not do it, do not put it in an email. That's the, that is the word that uh, flags the people who are uh, going to defraud you. And as soon as they see wiring instructions, it's like a little ding goes off, a bell goes off, and they will change things. So the seller and the closing company must communicate directly. Um, and all things will be coming from the title company should be encrypted. And you always want to have the seller verify that a title company sent an email. Sometimes there are fraudulent emails uh, around there. 11.7 uh, is the question that you want to ask on FERPA, which is the Foreign National Act, is are you a US citizen? And you want to say, if they say yes, then no problem, keep going. If they say no, please make a note because you have to tell the title company because there are documents that the seller has to sign and we have to inform the person who's going to buy about that because ultimately the buyer is going to be responsible if the seller doesn't pay his taxes at, at closing. There has to be taxes taken out at closing for a foreign national. And um, I don't remember the percentage, but it has to be done and it has to be done within a certain amount of days. On 11. Hi. 
Yes, yes. Anna? Yes. I'm sorry, for that one from for a citizen, what number is that? Because I ha I'm going to be getting a listing uh, and he's Thai and he's going to be moving back to Thailand. Okay, 11.7. Yeah, 11.7, .7. okay, thank you. Okay, so Clay, let me give you an yeah. idea. Call the title company you're going to use. Say, I'm, yes. getting, I'm getting a listing and I know that the person is not, is a foreign national. What kind of documentation do we need to send him so you can explain to him uh, what might be coming into them or send them to you and then you can explain it to them, however you think is appropriate. Okay. But, okay, uh, perfect. Huh? I, yeah, sounds good. Okay, great. All right, uh, 11 Thank eight. You. Yes, no problem. 11 eight is dealing with Colorado withholding tax. So if if uh, the seller lives part of the time in Arizona and part of the time here, when he sells the property here, there could be Colorado tax owed. There will be a 2% collection and then uh, the seller will get it back when he files his uh, state ta taxes. Um, then it tells you a little bit about the deposits. Now, 13 is dealing with what comes into the property or what is gonna stay with the property. And so, all of those are just standard things. And then when you get down here to where it says none, solar, water, security, um, satellite, that type of thing, then what you wanna do is if you don't have any of those things, check the box none. If you have one of them, then if I ask the question, are they owned or are they leased? Okay, because that makes a big difference. If they're leased, you need to get a copy of the lease and find out what it takes for a buyer to assume that lease if the buyer is going to be able to do so. Exclusions generally are here and it's just general information for you. Then on 13.1.3, then down here where I have none, um, then you wanna put the word, there are no encumbrances against the property, be sure you have none. And then 13.1.4, other inclusions. So you wanna, this is where you wanna put the kitchen refrigerator, the freestanding gas stove, the microwave, the ice maker, the wine refrigerator, whatever comes with it and where they're located. Then you don't have any leases on 13.1.5.1. And you go down to 13.2, which is exclusions. Most people leave the uh, refrigerator but most people take their washers and dryers. You wanna know where it's located, second floor, main floor, in the basement, wherever it is, okay? 13.3 in is uh, trade fixtures. You don't have any, so put none in those two places. Then on 13.4, we wanna be sure we're specific here. Yes, I know it's a three car attached garage, but the reason I have you fill this out is like Mary and another agent, Kevin, has a um, specific garage reserved. If you blow through this and you're so used to blowing through this, you won't ask the question, do you have a reserved spot? Is there a, rever is there a reverse reserve spot? What number is it? And then under storage facilities, um, in this case where one of the agents had to list where the closet storage was, it was in the basement um, by, by his reserved parking space. So you have to be specific and I want you to keep doing this because if you blow through this on a listing, you'll blow through it when you write an offer. So it's something to always want to keep in mind. You don't normally have water rights or other rights or well rights or water stock rights or growing crops rights. Those are all none, unless you are out in the eastern part of Douglas Albert uh, County and you could have a piece of land that would be able to have those things in there and we would do a different set of researches for that. Your owner encumbrance, when you get an uh, owner and encumbrance report back from the uh, title company, you will uh, um, uh, know ex if there's any liens against it. 14.3, you always check special warranty deed. 14.4, you put down and you can see this off your public records. 
what's the amount of the first or if there's a second you want to put it in here it's to make sure you ask the question do you know what your approximate balance is are you do you still have that mortgage do you still have that heloc you know these are questions you want to ask when you get to 14.4 16 is dealing with your hoa Mr. Seller, do you have an HOA? If you do, what's the monthly fee? If you've got more than one, you want to take and add the two together and divide. Like in, at Highlands Ranch, we have uh, here in the where area I live in, I've got a man, I've got one, and then I have the master HOA. So at $155, I divide that by three and add it to my monthly payment. That's what I pay monthly. Okay. I know there are no special assessments. This is important if you're listing a condo. Do you know of any special assessments? Do you know any special assessments that are coming up? These are questions that you always want to ask based on the information we have to convey to a buyer. And 17, I always put upon mutual agreement. And that way, because we don't have a contract to know when they're going to give possession or not. They may need a post-closing. That's a discussion when you have a seller. Can you get out of your house on the day of closing? No, I can't. How long do you need? So on, on uh, the private remarks that you give the agents, you have to put in there, seller needs post-closing. And then you may or may not sell or may or may not be paying for those days. They may. It just depends on how long they take to post closing. So on material defects, sellers always have to disclose a um, material defect. I would encourage you always to have, if at all possible, a seller's property disclosure on, on, on 18.2.1. Always have them fill it out and you are never to fill it out. They are the ones who fill it out. We already talked about lead-based paint. Then on 18.2.3 is carbon monoxide alarms. Before you list the property, you have to make sure there's carbon monoxide detectors in there, and they have to be within 15 feet of all sleeping areas. Um, I, in my world, I have one in the basement, I have one on the first floor and one on the second floor. I just want to be sure that if that thing goes off, I have them everywhere. Um, and then you have a right as the buyer and seller, buy, uh, the, I mean, excuse me, as the agents, seller has a right to cancel and the uh, agent has a right to cancel. Now, I will tell you, I will probably not cancel a seller's um, listing agreement because I am the last say so just because they want to do it on a whim. Now, if there's good reason and you guys aren't getting along, then absolutely I'll say yes. But I had a, a seller call me in the last three months who said to me, I hate this agent is just horrible. I don't want to work with him anymore. He doesn't do his job. And I said, what part of the seven, eight uh, deals he brought you? Did he not do his job? Well, I don't like his personality. Well, that doesn't give you a reason to bail. We got our new agent in our office and got another offer and it closed. But sellers sometimes can be very demanding and very difficult. Um, on 20 is if for some reason the buyers back out and the seller ends up with the earnest money, how is he gonna get it? I always gave it back to the seller. I never kept any, but if you keep some, that's okay too. So 20 all the way through to 28 is general information, can't discriminate, you need legal counsel, you have to automatically go to mediation if there's a dispute on the earnest money and those types of things. In paragraph 28, I normally don't have too much in there, but that's where you would put down, if you have a transaction coordinator, her list, she's gonna handle all paperwork and it's gonna be paid, who's it being paid by the seller or by the listing agent? Okay, or you might put in um, that you're going to have price reductions at the end of two weeks if your house hasn't sold, uh, hasn't received offers and blah, blah, blah. So that generally is what goes in there, not a whole lot of anything else. 29 is where you put all of these um, pieces of information that needs to go to a seller, a seller's property disclosure square foot seller advisory, and this one would be where you put seller advisory, the COVID advisory uh, for COVID-19. 
common interest community checklist if there's an HOA, closing instructions and seller's proceeds sheet, lead-based paint uh, obligation and sales. These are things that will all go to a seller. And I'll tell you in a minute how you do that in which order you would do it. The rest of these are pretty self-explanatory in the seller sign. And when you set CTME up or DocuSign, your signature and information should be here. By the way, uh, yes, um, that should help. Now your next document that goes to a seller is definitions of working relationship. You are a seller's agent, okay? Then you go down here and uh, on whatever date you're providing it to the seller and it's via email or snail mail, whatever it is you're doing. Hopefully it's email. That's the second document. Third document is seller advisory. This is a document that Damien, our in-house attorney, puts together advising the sellers about earnest money dispute. Please take away your seller's valuables, what happens prior when a seller is uh, prior to closing. I would never suggest that you do that, please. Uh, disclosure, um, panels, fraud, wire fraud, uh, HOA information, it just goes on. This is informational for your seller, okay? Now, the documents that go to the seller in the beginning are as follows. One is your listing document, which has all the information we went through. Two is definitions of working relationship. Three is seller advisory. And four would be your seller co-vet advisory. Those are all sent to a seller in one email and you need to walk through the, make sure that they understand before they sign the listing agreement in big bold letters, do not sign till we talk. Okay, when you see and send over your email. That way they can go through these documents with you and you can see them. You can either do it by email or um, sit down physically with them. That's the first grouping that goes to a seller. Now, once those documents are all signed, your second grouping that you send to a seller via email is your square foot disclosure. The number two is where you get your you check the box and on the first one is providing information and you put it from the assessor's office, which comes off your realist. And if they have a basement, then you put the basement square feet. If they don't, then you don't have it. You just have this one line. Then you have your signature on it. You send it, uh, you don't send it yet, but this is the second, uh, disc first disclosure that a, a, a seller will sign. Your second group one is called source of water. Even though you have on a condo an HOA that actually provides the water possibly, give them information and a website to go look at that if at all possible. There are many buyers that water is a concern. In my area, we have mine comes from the Metro District and it includes the water, uh, the um, sewer lights and things like that. And it's about 80, anywhere from 80 to $83 a month, uh, every other month. So you wanna know, do they get a bill every month? Do they get a bill every other month? Um, and approximately what that would be. So we wanna be sure they get information to go and see it. If it's a family, a family home, they wanna know what that water is and they can try to call the title company, the, title, the water company to find out what, what an average water bill would be, or they can even ask the seller. But at this point, this is really information. So we need a, we need a seller to buy, and then when the buyer buys, he will sign he or she or both will sign it. This is the seller's property disclosure, which is filled out only by the seller. If they had a roof repair in 2018, then put it down, say it was repaired and it is completed and it is working fine, something along those lines. If there was a water leak, put it in there. If there's something in there that you need that was fixed, then say that. Don't leave anything out because I will guarantee you the inspector will find it, whatever it is. So the seller fills this out. They either know or they don't know, or you can just give a comment on the, in the comment section and they can fill this out online as you send it through them to them in CTME. Or Anna, I have a quick question on this. Yes. 
So I got this one one or back and it's practically blank. Um, again, theirs was a new build in 2020 and it's a condo, so they don't have a lot of the stuff. So is that okay? Fine, absolutely. Yeah. I signed it, but it's just <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't have anything because they didn't have any. It's, you know, it's not even two years old yet. So that's really what it is. Yeah. So no, a lot of them are blank, to be honest with you. Okay, the next one is the closing instructions. So we put down who's your title company, make sure you decide on one, the address of the property on line 15. When an offer comes, become, comes in and you accept it as a contract, line 16, you need to put the date of the contract in here, okay? You need on to paragraph two, the title company agrees and that the insurance, the closing company agrees to furnish copy of exceptions, okay? Check both those boxes. Then when you go down a little farther on paragraph five, closing fees, ask your title company what the closing fees. There's a closing fee for the a real estate side, a closing fee for the lender side. That's a total of something. It could be 350, could be 370, could be 250. It's all over the ballpark. So ask them what it is and put it in there. That, that way, you know, when the uh, offer comes in, there's a split between this a dollar amount most of the time. Eight is how does the seller want to proceed, uh, receive their proceeds? Check. Or if they wire it again, we go through and make sure that the, only the seller talks to the title company about the wiring instructions, period. Then you go down here and every generally not too much goes in uh, past this. And then you go down here and you will uh, go ahead and put in the name of your closer and then put the address of the title company and the closer closing company past that there in like in additional provisions on 16 there really isn't a lot that goes in there unless somebody is going to sign for the seller and then they have to get uh the proper document for that okay and you need to notify the the the, the title company so that they can give you the proper document to get notarized also if your seller is not in or uh, the uh, state at the time and it has to be mailed out, that needs to be specified in these instructions because these go to the title company to be signed. Your next document is a lead based paint obligation if it applies and it's filled out just with the address and the sellers need to understand what this means. And your next document is your sales, which they need to check the box. No, they have no knowledge. No, they have no reports. And then when the buyer gets in, he checks their boxes and everybody signs, including all agents. If you do not, it's a $16,000 fine per person, okay? So we do not want anybody to be fined. And we will be audited. And that's the first thing that the auditors go and look at. Now you put together a seller's net proceed sheet. Now, I would encourage you actually to do this one when you did your presentation and you have them sign this uh, depending on whatever their price is. When an offer comes in, then you want to do another one so that they know what they're approximately going to net out of these five offers, which one is the better one. Now, when you get offers, guys, it is not always based on price. It's closing date, a possession date. It could be how much they're putting down. So there's a lot of things to look at when an offer comes in, okay? But if you send them with this grouping, that's fine. So your next grouping is gonna be all of your disclosures, your closing instructions and net sheet if you hadn't sent it to them already. So all of that is the second email that goes out. Please sit and make sure you instruct them on how to fill them out and make sure if you can answer any questions, okay? Any questions on these? Okay, so now we have common interest community checklist, which is in that second email. This is only used if there's an HOA. If this HOA is there, the seller needs to answer these questions and make sure there is no signature line. It is only informational that we send to a buyer when it, the, the offer becomes a contract. This way they know if there's a second HOA, a first HOA, and what basically is in 
those HOAs that the, sell, the buyers need to understand and what they get. Now, if we have a buyer that does not want to uh, get a inspection or doesn't want a home warranty on the property, I need you to be sure that you uh, check these boxes. Uh, did they choose an inspector? Great. If you know the name, that's good to put it in. But if they, this is more if they decline. Buyer decides against having it because you see in contracts that come in, they're waiving inspections. Make sure that they sign this document that they have decided against having a property that you uh, inspect it. You can send this and one if they don't want a home warranty that you can send this to the selling agent and have the buyer sign it. I want to protect you guys. And this is the best way to do it because if they come back and want to sue us, which some people do. What I want to be sure is that you guys are protected. So if no, if somebody is not getting it, uh, an inspection, please be sure that you put uh, have give this to the selling agent and have the buyer sign it. If you get an email to that fact, that's also signed good, but I would prefer to have the buyer's signature on a document that says we've decided not to have an inspection. I want to protect you guys. Now, this is called the septic use permit. This is a document that is used when you have a well and septic system. The septic system, a usage permit almost in every county, I think, except Morgan is the one I believe doesn't have this, but they have a report that goes along. You need to specify in your contract an additional provision who's going, the seller is going to get a usage permit three days prior to closing and is at seller's expense. Okay. Now, what happens is there's an agent in Elizabeth who likes to charge, have the buyers pay for this usage permit. They'll get it, but they charge the buyer. So you want to be very specific if you're going to have to ask for one, who's going to pay for it, okay? Normally, you could ask, normally it's the uh, seller. And a lot of times, which is probably 99.9%, .9%, the lenders will not close if this has got a septic system and it hasn't got a usage permit to it. It's rare that they will do that. Okay, the next one is about E&O insurance. If you're gonna sell your personal residence, we have E&O insur e insurance on everybody in the office. You guys, um, you have to use the following documents. You have to put a seller's property disclosed together you have to put on a home warranty, buyers must have a home inspection, and you have to use Colorado State approved forms. That's the requirements to keep your E&O insurance intact when you sell your own house. Now, you have an E&O deductible of $2,500. So if somebody decides to sue you, your obligation is $2,500. So I would be very careful in trying to help somebody and you didn't charge $2,500 because that could be your E&O deductible, okay? So that seems, that's the last one. Oop, no, 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 last one is this. Now, if you have a property that might have a well on it and the well, this is a checklist. It's just basically for benefit, benefits for an agent to give to a buyer. Um, and you just have some, have the seller can fill this out or you can fill it out. But this is just gen information generally of what it is. This way, um, a buyer will always get an inspection on a well and they determine that if there's radon in it or what the flow is and there's so many, it's supposed to flow certain ways or if the valve is, valve is not correct or the pump's going bad or something. That's what a buyer gets an inspection on, but you just wanna see if the seller will fill this out so you can pass this on to the buyer. It's just informational only. Now, who's got questions? Anybody got any questions on anything? This is an awful quiet group. 
I asked my questions. Yeah, you have one? No, I said I asked mine. Oh, you asked yours. Clay, I know you got your listing coming up. Do you have any questions on your on yours? No, I think I'm good. I'm just uh, going to have to talk to Land Title and about his uh, residency status. Yeah, yeah, that is the. Uh, you might as well get all that information, Clay, up front because you're going to have yeah. to have it one way or the okay. other. Okay. Actually, I do have a question that really doesn't have anything to do with this. It is regarding my upcoming listing. Uh, in my old office in Highlands Ranch, when you were working there, we had a forum, I believe it was through through Facebook or something, where we could ask all the uh, agents in the office if they have any handymen that can work on decks and do repairs around the house. Do we have that in this we have, Yeah, we have that in uh, Park Meadows. You can call Bailey and find out, I, I don't know, I thought you were part of that group, but she can tell you how to become part of it. Bailey? Bailey is our front desk person when you call in. Oh, she, okay. she will, she'll answer your question. Sounds good, that's the only questions I have, thank you. You're welcome. Jimmy, do you have something? No, thank you, just learning. <laughs> Looking <laughs> from his fire hose, <laughs> there you go. Bonnie, do you have anything? Are you good? Nope, I'm good, thanks. Okay, well, then I think we're all done for today. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call or email or text me your email, okay? You guys have a great day. Talk to you later. Thank bye. you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.